Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 367. Science Faction, the origin of nuclear weapons, part two. We didn't cover it all last time? We did not, because we didn't have our, our nuclear expert here, so I, I just had to kind of like stumble my way through it, but now I was we're here. Get... I was here last time as well. I that don't understand. That is true. I forgot your experience on a reactor for dozens of years. I would like to imagine I would have been good on a nuclear submarine. <laughs> <laughs> I just imagine you eating it. Like, I imagine you eating this, like, the spent uranium. And dying or getting superpowers? No, I just feel like you're like, it's a really lazy way to microwave your food. You're like, this is kind of a warm rod. What if I just, like, put my hot dog next to this for an hour or two? And then I have to wrestle my hot dog when it mutates. <laughs> I think instead of the mouth, he likes putting that up the other end. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> true. That's why they call him radioactive colon. <laughs> We're a super villain <laughs> I make a real dirty bomb. <laughs> <laughs> He's really easy to fight. He's very weak. He vomits a lot. Yeah. Uh, he really can't walk. His legs are... Uh. Yeah, he's just more of like an explosion risk at any point, you know? It just turns around. Oh, uh, and speaking of an explosion risk guy, of course, I'm your host, comedian archaeologist, Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing great. And you're right. You are an explosion risk because at any moment, Bobby could ex start exploding with the N-word repeatedly. <laughs> that is kind of my M.O., isn't it? <laughs> the longtime listeners of the show. Yeah, they're like, you know, we come for the science, but we stay for the racism. <laughs> you know, you could edit those out. You should hear them off air. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of somebody else you should hear off air is none other than our scientist for the afternoon, Dr. Troy. Dr. Troy, how you doing? Great to be here. We got fascinating topics today. I'm excited to talk about them. We've got more than just fascinating topics. We could call this the Dr. Troy episode. So I will sometimes take suggestions from scientists. Is that uh, what you're going to call it in the yes, title? Yes, absolutely. I think I will. I also uh, like the idea that you're Paula Deen behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> I did a lot of butter. <laughs> Yep, not say the N word. I, I love this N word butter. This sentence doesn't make grammatical sense. Indeed. So usually I will let the scientists suggest an article or two that they want to talk about in the main show as long as they get it to me by Thursday night and I can write it in there. Dr. Troy is o the only one who has ever taken me up on this. He will send me articles Thursday night. Everybody else just goes, eh, whatever you think, you'll be fine. But this week is something different because even then I still write the intro bits. In fact, I usually start writing the intro bit on Monday and I write it throughout the week. Dr. Troy actually suggested a different intro bit this week. So this is the all Dr. Troy episode because he suggested uh, both the article we will be talking about in Science Articles and the intro bit. So congratulations, Dr. Troy. You are slowly taking over Science Faction. I just heard that. Uh, I mean, you did the first part a couple weeks ago. Yep. And I was like, man, I wish I were there to talk about it. So, <laughs> Man, I got to correct that asshole. <laughs> <laughs> no, just to add more cool stuff. There was so much cool stuff. And speaking of cool stuff, if you guys missed out, we just had Nerd Night last week. It was a great one. They had Death from Space as a two separate talks, Death from Space Part 1, done by an astrophysicist who talked about things like coronal mass ejections and gamma ray bursts and asteroid impacts and all this stuff. And then you had Death from Space Part 2, done by a paleontologist who talked about all the major extinction events that have happened on Earth and the ones that were caused by gamma ray explosions or asteroid impacts or methanogens. Yeah. I could do a part three one on the possibilities of synthetic life and designer. Even organism. better. Yes, that is. But that wouldn't be death from space. Unless, unless they unless, replaced unless, us. That would be death from within. I mean, yes, we, we, exactly. we were engineers. There's a lot of death within. There's certainly <laughs> a lot of those that are that are sitting there. But uh, one of the things I didn't know is I didn't realize there was actually, we're pretty certain, an extinction that was caused by a gamma ray burst, which is kind of crazy to think yeah, of. Yeah, I like, heard about that one. Yeah, and, like, just, and it more affected one side of the Earth than the other because it's where the gamma ray burst hit. And that's a crazy thing to think of because we would never know. Like, we would never know it happened. Happened. It travels at the speed of light, so we couldn't see the thing before it happened. It would just we would all just be talking here, and then suddenly dead. What would it look like if I? If I oh, let's say I'll, I was peeing. Was, in, I was peeing in a lead bunker. It would be incredibly bright if you could see it. It would be like it would be so bright. It would be. Uh, I think he said it would be so bright that it would like basically singe your eyes out. But also, you wouldn't know. It would irradiate and kill you so fast. You would. But, but when I okay, I'm peeing in a lead bunker. I get out. Gamma burst happened. What does it look? What do you? Guys oh, everything's look like? dead. So there are. The gamma ray burst could be in a range of billions of light years from the planet. So there are certainly distances at which you would just immediately get fried. There could be ones far enough away that just happen to hit us where you get a lower dose and don't die immediately. Mm. And then we can go by accounts of people who have been exposed to really high flashes of radiation. And they have accounts of like experiencing great warmth and like a big blue glow. So you do. Sounds kind of sweet, actually. <laughs> yeah, it sounds interesting. Jesus? And it wouldn't be your photoreceptors um, detecting these things because they're yeah. not sensitive to those wavelengths. It would be your neurons being, you know, 
interacted with directly. I think his, some sensation. I, but, but what your eyes will re- uh, see is the reaction of those gamma rays with what it's hitting in the atmosphere. I think that's what he was saying would be unbelievably bright that you couldn't see. Yeah, that would also be unbelievably bright. So anyway, uh, very, very interesting stuff. Come on out to Nerd Night and next month, first Tuesday of every month, 6.30 p.m. at 32 North Brewing. But for now, let's go on to the origins of nuclear weapons part two. So wait, we didn't get it all covered the first time. Are yes. we got, are we now, are we talking about new future nuclear weapons? We are actually going to touch a little bit on some future stuff, but we want to go back and talk about some of the stuff that we maybe skipped over. So brief precursor, as Dr. Troy mentioned, we have talked about this before. We talked about the development of nuclear weapons from a conceptual framework uh, in the early 20th century. All the maybe even a little bit if you're talking about the Curie stuff, the late 19th century, and then all the way up through the Manhattan Project and the development phase and all the physics that went on in between to make that possible, and then the eventual development uh, and proliferation of nuclear weapons. But Dr. Troy uh, wanted to go back and speak a little bit about some of the interesting stuff that went on in there that we didn't cover. So uh, where do you want to start, Dr. Troy? You want to start with uh, Einstein's letter? That seems like a good place to start because this guy, Leo Szilard, I think was the first to realize Oh, crap. With the energy that is given off in a, you know, neutron decay of these fissile elements like uranium, th- there's like a ton of energy in that nucleus. Yes. And we now know that's because that's sort of condensed energy from a supernova yes. that it got forged in, just like the fossil fuels we burn are condensed energy from the sun yes. that got solidified from living things mm-hmm. into long hydrocarbon chains. And so he was like, oh my God, if we set up a chain reaction of these things and each neutron coming in to some mass of fissile material like uranium set off more than one neutron coming out of the atom it hit and you had a critical mass of these things it would release a ridiculous amount of energy like this is really scary it's also during you know political tension times and i think it was already world war ii or like leading up to it something like that so he makes this realization and he tells einstein he's like we need to tell like the president of the United States that we have to do something about this or the Germans will figure this out because the first people doing the fissile research, I think it got published in Nature in 1939. So it Mm. would have been World War II. They were Germans, I think, or at least European. He got a hold of Einstein and sat down with him and explained it. And Einstein was like, oh, crap, you're right. Doesn't this sound like a a movie, though? Like, think about it. You have a guy who, like, looks up from the paper and goes, oh, my God, the end of the world. What am I going to do? Nobody will listen to me. I better call the smartest man on Earth. Einstein, let's go on a road trip. We need to solve this shit. And then it's like, it's like. Hold on, I'm having sex with my cousin right now. Could we (laughs) reschedule this? It's like Mr. Smith goes to Washington, where I imagine them, like, storming the White House. And they're like, you got to see the data. It's like. They're basically Jeff Goldblum's character in Independence Day yelling about the aliens coming. I feel a bit that way in my biological research, actually. Now. Yeah. I'm like seeing how scary it is that I can actually predict how a microbe is going to evolve to the single base pair level. Oh, and, yeah. Like, engineer it. That's scary. I kind of want to go talk to someone and say, hey, take bioterrorism. Oh, seriously. I've been thinking about this forever about how we talked actually the last time we talked about nuclear weapons about the reason we haven't had a terrorist group detonate a nuclear weapon, which is the weird physics of it just so happens to be. And the world didn't have to be made this way, but it just so happens to be that you can either take a type of nuclear material that is somewhat available from nuclear reactors around the world and get pretty easily, but in order to create a nuclear bomb out of that material, it takes a tremendous amount of engineering sophistication that those groups don't have. Or you take the material that's very, very hard to get, but anybody, the people in this room included, could build a nuclear device out of it. And so we just got lucky that that's the way it is, because otherwise, if that material, the easy-to-access material, was also easy to engineer a bomb out of, we would probably have numerous of those explosions throughout the world. So the easy-to-access material, I assume you're referring to uranium. No, no, no. Easy-to-access easy plutonium. Oh, you, I guess nowadays it is. So You pull I it out of a reactor. Back, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so origin, before we had a reactors, yes. th- there was just, you know... Earth has uranium ores, Mm -hmm. whereas plutonium, we don't have ores of plutonium. Sure. So that was the thought that like, if we're going to, and uranium's fissile, if we're going to make a nuclear bomb, it would be through uranium. But But even even then, in the original Manhattan Project, they only got enough material for one uranium bomb, and they could make two plutonium ones. Exactly. Because by that point, they had switched over to plutonium. Yeah, okay. So now, at this point in time, yeah, we can make much more plutonium. But before we started making plutonium, there wasn't any in the Earth. Yes, that's true. So, So it was like, okay, we have to make a uranium bomb, but then only one of the rarer isotopes of uranium 
is suitable for nuclear bombs of this type. Well, when you look at India, Pakistan, North Korea, all of those countries got their nuclear weapons from literally walking inside nuclear reactors, pulling the plutonium out, and then enriching it until you could get the, the stuff for it. Isn't there a third element you can make a nuclear weapon out of? It just hasn't been done yet, but that I had read, so like Neptunium or something, or... I mean, sure. anything that decays mm. into one of those and then could have a neutron cascade. Any, Yeah, anything that has a nuclear chain reaction. So instead of chemical reactions propagating in a way that releases energy, it's literally atoms splitting apart. So there there could be different types of chain reactions in... Uh, I realized when I was mm-hmm. listening to the first episode, I didn't explain this so well, but I've heard an analogy that I really like in terms of what goes on in a nuclear explosion. So we talked about this neutron cascade. What is that? Well, there are certain elements that when they get hit by a neutron, we talked about this, they release a tremendous amount of energy. And in addition to that, more neutrons. So imagine that you are shooting into a box of grenades, right? And you shoot one of those grenades and it goes off. Well, as it goes off, it releases a tremendous amount of energy, but it also releases a bunch of other little bullets that spread out, right? Now imagine each one of those bullets hits another grenade in that box. That grenade releases a bunch of energy and a bunch more bullets. And basically all the grenades, if you do the the device right, all the grenades go off, release all their energy, all their bullets that continue and, and continue, and that's what causes the damage. The problem can happen in nuclear devices when one of those grenades goes off and blows the other ones away, and then you can't basically, that critical mass gets taken away and you can't have a nuclear chain reaction, and then it just blows up like TNT would. So when you're thinking about how this is working internally, imagine that grenade analogy, and each time it's hitting one of those uranium uh, atoms, It's releasing that energy and then a few of those little grenade pellets and those go and hit another uranium atom, et cetera, et cetera. And that's called supercriticality where you have set off this chain of more than one neutron spreading out. And if you have the geometry right of the fissile material, it'll Mm -hmm. set up ideally a a nuclear bomb if, if that's your intention. Yes. And that's why nuclear power is so much more difficult than a nuclear bomb. Yes. Because you can't just have more than one neutron coming out with each collision. Uh You have to have exactly one or else it's going to explode. And you have to moderate those neutrons with something like water in order to make sure that you can direct them where you need to and shield them from going where you don't. And what you want is for enough of those to be going for you to get a continual expelling of energy that makes heat. So it heats up those rods that then later create steam without having so much that the thing blows itself apart. So they knew in the nuclear bomb designs that they would need to be subcritical before detonation, Mm -hmm. and the detonation would have to make them critical. Yes. Uh, And that would be moving chunks of this material of the right geometric arrangement and with the right speed together. And so in all all the testing phases, this is the demon core, which I find fascinating. Oh, this is a Uh, very interesting story. Yeah, because it was a radioactive core, sort of two hemispheres of this material, and the type of nuclear bomb it was going to go into was one that sort of exploded them together yep. so that they would hit at high speed and then undergo this super criticality, super criticality in a way that didn't make it blow itself apart before the reaction could complete. It was so, the gun type that we talked about before, where it's like literally a cannon that launches it at each other. Yeah. And the so, uranium ones? Yep. Yep. <coughs> um, so the demon core was these two hemispheres killed two people in criticality accidents. Two like, separate accidents. Two separate accidents, like months apart. Uh, And one was they were testing the criticality of it and uh, because it's all a mission of neutrons and how they interact with. So remember, you're trying to you're trying to control where those little pellets are coming from the grenade so that they hit the other little pellets. And what these people are trying to do is test because remember, the bomb either goes off or it doesn't. So they need to try and test whether or not it can get to that super critical phase before it does. So they get really, really, really close and measure it. Or I think in the case of the first one you're about to to talk about, they basically have some kind of substance. Was it beryllium? Beryllium. So they, they took some kind of substance. They have these little bricks. And they're using it almost like creating a Lego palace around the thing to direct the neutrons. Basically, we're going to use this to direct the neutron flow back into the system. Yeah, it's a neutron mirror they yeah. used. And so that's how they were testing principles of the system. And what happened was somebody dropped one of the mirror bricks that yep. they were building the mirror enclosure to test. And just the configure it change in angle of how the neutrons were bouncing off caused a brief moment of well it landed on the actual core and so think of you know you're trying to there's something that's like hot radiating heat and you're trying to capture the heat so you're putting like reflective blankets around it now imagine one of those reflective blankets that's standing a little bit away from it falls right on top of it well that's going to get hot real fast because it's directing the heat right at it and right back into itself so it's going to do that that's what happened this neutron moderator fell on top of the fucking thing and now it's shooting the neutrons up into it and all those neutrons are getting reflected back into it 
And I mean, quite frankly, we're lucky more of these things don't end in huge explosions. But what this ended in, it was a huge release of energy and neutron radiation. And then the guy died of radiation poisoning later, right? Yeah. I mean, the, it just fell and hit the sphere and then fell off. It was like a one second incident, but he yeah. incident. But he described, you know, I, I felt a wave of heat and saw a blue flash and he died of acute radiation poisoning. And that's really... Is he doing this in suits or is it... Uh... No, no. So they later stressed how important it was yeah. to keep in mind, like, super criticality is a big deal. You can't just mm. drop a block. Like, you will mm. die. And the second incident of the Demon Core was... The second one's better because it's less of a, oh, that's just an accident and more of... That's Bill. He's an asshole, and he does a lot of stupid stuff, and it finally caught up he's to him. He's juggling the bricks or that's, something? <laughs> that's true, because he was, he was like using a screwdriver in between the two to bring them close, and then yeah. it slipped, and they fell together, and you know he got a lethal dose of radiation. Now, would, uh, with the suit, would that moderate uh, this it, at all? Or? The dose would be so high. I mean, maybe some sort of really thick lead suit, but there's a level of radiation that you're just fucked. But it, it might have... I mean, it, it also depends on your proximity because there were other people in the room with that guy, but his body actually shielded them a lot from some of the radiation. Yeah, it's all about the dose you receive. And it's there's different levels of radiation poisoning, um, but there's a level at which you're just going to die. There's nothing that can be done, and it's called the walking ghost phase because it takes you a couple days to die because what has happened is the radiation killed all the fast dividing cells in your body. So the lining of your intestines and your bone marrow that gives you your red blood cells, those are the ones, fast dividing ones, are more prone to damage from radiation. Mm -hmm. That's why they're, in fact, that's why your bone marrow is inside your bones, to hide it from UV. Your gut lining is also hidden from UV. Uh, by that point, it's you're still alive. You still have your old red blood cells. You still have, your gut lining hasn't sloughed off yet, mm -hmm. but it is going to in the next couple days. And then you're going to have sepsis and no blood, and so there's just nothing you can do. You're going to die a horrible, horrible, death. horrible, horrible those, death. Those deaths are always the ones that trip me out, are the ones where something happens, it's real brief, and you know you're going to die, and there's nothing anybody can do. They're like, there's no treatment. There's like like ricin. Like if somebody gave you ricin, and then they just said, oh, hey, by the way, the drink you had in an hour and a half ago had ricin in it. I put it in there. Congratulations. You could go to every research scientist in the world for the next three days you have to live, and nobody can do a fucking thing for you. Well, your you're going to die. Turn to goo in right with rice, and don't they like? like I mean, that? I don't know if that's technically the medical thing that's just gonna get described, but it's goop, the Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not familiar with the mechanism of ricin, but with individual basically stops your protein, the proteins in your body from working. Okay, yeah, with individual molecules, you could theoretically, once we get better at protein design, design some artificial thing that traps it and sure. use it as a treatment immediately after exposure but if you get hit by a brief flash of supercriticality yeah it just ruined trillions or billions at least of your cells so there's just nothing you're going to be able to do so what you're saying is if wolverine the superhero wolverine were to you know adamantium doesn't exist but i assume it's not lead he if he were in this walking ghost phase that might kill him the only way to prevent this is if he were to have instead of adamantium the lead bone surgery I think that just gives, his, that, yeah. that just gives you lead poisoning. Yeah, that Wolverine's point. a lot dumber now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the other interesting parts about the the whole nuclear development process was what was really interesting. If you think about it, this is when they're designing this idea of a nuclear explosion. None has ever gone off on Earth before, right? And so one of the ideas they had is, what if this like literally ignites our atmosphere? Like somebody did the math, and they're like, based on the relative amount of oxygen versus nitrogen in our atmosphere kind of worried that this thing is going to literally blow up the earth could you imagine that because like somebody thought that they brought that idea up it was discussed they realized they couldn't rule it out as a possibility and they still blew the motherfucker up so well, well you have to understand we really dislike the japanese <laughs> <laughs> so i researched into that because i was yeah. like holy shit if they actually thought it might yeah. destroy the entire planet why would they even possibly risk it it was something that was proposed like hey with a blast of this intensity We've never had anything like this before. We should be careful that the calculations don't indicate yeah. that all the nitrogen that is 78% of our atmosphere might not undergo a similar chain reaction due to the crazy shock wave. And they did do the calculations and they were like, oh, it's not an issue. So Okay, they, so they, they did have actually, some math behind them? Yeah, they were like, this definitely is not going to happen. So they weren't actually concerned, but they did do the math. And then they're like, and if it does, we're doing it in New Mexico. So they go first. <laughs> <laughs> I envision a drug called amphetamines being in invented one day, and they'll be huge in this area. I'm a student of the history of science, and uh -huh. so there's all these crazy physicists who got Nobel Prizes for understanding how the world worked who also worked on the Manhattan Project, and yep. it's really fascinating to learn about. 
And so Richard Feynman is one of them who... He's great. You can still see his lectures online. Fantastic, because he's the smartest guy with the dumb guy accent that you've ever heard in your life. No, but dumb guy accents, there's a lot. He's got like the he's Brooklyn, not, okay, Long yeah. Island, yeah. Oh, yeah. no wait. I no, believe... Richard Feynman here. I believe, if you listen to his lectures, he says nuclear, like... <laughs> <laughs> and if you were to just casually talk to this dude on a train or like, I don't know, beating a homeless guy, he sounds like a guy <laughs> who does that stuff. You'd be like, oh, it's just a regular everyday Joe. And then you actually listen to what he's saying. And you're like, this is probably one of the five smartest people on earth at the time he's talking. This was, that's like Marissa Tomei and yes. my cousin Vinny. Yes. <laughs> yes. I believe she's actually based on Richard Feynman. <laughs> yeah. Richard Feynman's amazing. I did my undergrad at Caltech, which is where he was. And mm-hmm. so he's yeah. a, a super legend there. But he, as a youth, he hadn't even gotten his graduate degree yet, started working on the Manhattan Project and started impressing people with how talented he was and working with, like, I think the human computer team, because this was back before we had computers yeah, to do the back calculations. when computer meant a person. Yeah, and he would play pranks like lockpicking the physicists' cabinets by guessing that their combinations were like the decimal approximation for E, oh. or, if it was six characters, and like <laughs> getting it right, and then leaving prank files in their cabinet and then closing it up and then they thought there was a, a German spy and kind of freaked oh. out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm just kind of a genius and a prankster. My mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Feynman's awesome. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, and he did amazing work and von Neumann is another person I'm just in awe of. I mean, if you read about John von Neumann, every single like genius from the past hundred years, his Wikipedia page has a subsection called cognitive abilities uh-huh. and you look him up and it's every genius you've heard of is like, oh, yeah, von Neumann's the only genius I've ever met. Like he, Oh, really? I just could never keep up with him. And he did so much work in quantum mechanics and computation and helping the nuclear bomb. I thought one of the more interesting contributions he had was the design for the plutonium-type bomb. Okay, so the uranium the, the bomb. Implosion, the, the implosion, the universal type. implosion. Yeah. yeah, so not these two hemispheres that come together and yeah. reach criticality, and it comes from an ore in the Earth. It's from an artificial element that we created in reactors. And then you need a different approach based on how it releases neutrons. Mm-hmm. And you would kind of have to implode it into yes. a point to get it dense enough that the chain reaction takes off and leads to a nuclear bomb. And so he pioneered, I think you're oversimplifying that we could build these in our basements because we definitely couldn't. No, the gun, we, the gun type we could. Gun we, type we could. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is that's the, That is why we have not had a terrorist group set up a nuclear weapon because – the type that you make that's easy to make that you and I could make in our garages is the one that has the hard material to get. The one that has material in every single nuclear reactor around the world is one that is very difficult to engineer to the point where you need a state almost, state level engineering. Okay, I thought you said the opposite. But ah. yeah, that's that's exactly right. And so he realized to have a, the proper implosion, an implosion is the reverse of an explosion. Yes. Instead of a circular shock wave going outwards. You need like cir- shape charges all pointed inwards. Exactly. That, sh- that also have to go off at the exact same time. Not somewhat similar because then you're going to blow it out one side. Well, so this was von Neumann's contribution. You could have them at different times technically, but he pioneered explosive lenses, mm. uh, which is really interesting because an implosion is literally... Worst contact <laughs> company ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank God, doctor. I haven't been able to see anything. I hope this new... Pres- oh, my God! <laughs> I don't even think you get to yell. I think your head just blows up. <laughs> but if you have a spherical chunk of plutonium, the way you want to implode it is literally a time reversal of an explosion. So it has to, with full radial symmetry, just expand inwards. And if you're doing that with explosions from the outside... Explosions from the outside have circular shock waves, and so they wouldn't all hit it in a way that made it come in in a perfect sphere. Mm. It would come in in a bunch of different points. And so there you need shaped charges. And von Neumann was a pioneer of that as well, where explosions that release a lot of energy all at once normally just do it in a circular shock wave. But if you can direct that shock wave in a particular direction uh, with a shaped charge, yeah. you get more power in the direction you want. And it's so a real he, uh, Tim Taylor of the physics community. Yeah. Feynman was the Al Borland of the experiment. <laughs> I don't know either of those names. <laughs> damn it. Damn our age. <laughs> he realized we could have explosive lenses. So have these explosions that, sure, they send out a circular shock wave, but then the material they pass through before they hit the plutonium core shapes the shock wave mm. in a way that warps it to be perfectly 
spherically symmetric by the time it hits the core. And then when it hits the core, it just goes perfectly inwards. Yeah, if you ever look at one of their devices, one of the plutonium devices, it looks fucking, it looks like what somebody in the 1950s would have thought like future microwaves look like. It is so technologically advanced and beautiful. And the fact that you get an explosion when you have a super criticality, you release a bunch of energy all at once, but to get a sustained chain reaction, that's how you get sustained power you can use for something other than an su- explosion, mm-hmm. like in nuclear reactors. That's just a principle of thermodynamics, and that process goes on in every one of your cells in the electron transport chain because the process of metabolism, its end goal is to shuttle electrons to your mitochondria sure, and then eventually attach those to oxygen and make water. And it goes through the electron transport chain, which instead of just in one big step, sending the electrons onto the oxygen and harnessing the energy from that, Mm -hmm. it goes through a bunch of tiny little steps. It draws out the process. And thermodynamically, you can extract more work from that. Mm. And so that's why that evolved. Interesting. It's always funny when you break everything down, you realize like, oh, shit, wait, why do I need oxygen? And why do I need food? It's just this Krebs cycle. And that's it. That is, it literally just comes down to energy chemistry in the end as to why I need to breathe. And that's why I die if somebody chokes me. Yeah. And why why does oxygen cause cancer? Because yes. it's a really good electron attractor. Yep. And that's great for generating energy, but it's also going to fuck up some molecules in your body and generate free radicals. I'm picturing Bobby as like a fight coach. Like, listen, you want to learn how to do the proper choke? You have to take the proper physiology classes to know the science behind why you need that oxygen. If you don't know why you're, the ATP is being moved through the Krebs cycle, you're not going to get this arm bar. Coach, I just really feel like the other guy's just working on arm bars. And, <laughs> and I'm... I'm not really thinking of life after the fight game right now. <laughs> now, what's interesting is all this. a lot of this stuff was like theoretical at first, right? But, oh, yeah, totally. But a bunch of groups started working on it. Like you said, the uh, Germans started working on it. We discussed how the Japanese came out with a group that started working on, on the nuclear bomb as well. Why but did th- we complete it and not Japan, not Germany? I'll tell you exactly why. It's because originally we didn't have access to the plutonium types, which is more abundant now because we have nuclear reactors. Yeah. The only option was the uranium type where you had to just get tons and tons of this uranium ore do really careful isotopic distillation to get the one isotope you need which is a small percentage of the total uranium there. exactly and so i really love this story of after we dropped the nukes on japan you know we'd already beaten germany we had their scientists that had been working on their nuclear program and germany's nuclear program never got far it was just theoretical yeah. like they never got enough uranium not even close yeah I, th- I think they actually thought it was impossible to get enough uranium. And that was one of the reasons they abandoned the program. It's like, the U.S. isn't getting it. We're not getting it. Who cares? Exactly. Because they realized what a large scale operation you would need to get enough to start making yeah. the a feasible uranium gun type bomb. Uh, and they didn't really know about plutonium yet. So the, the German scientists were in some house, you know, on house arrest, and they were under surveillance and recording since we'd beaten Germany. And we have a record of when we first told them Like, hey, by the way, you know those nuclear bomb theories you guys worked on? We actually just dropped two of those on Japan, uh, and they work. And, you know, we destroyed a couple cities and killed a few hundred thousand people. And the responses of the scientists are fascinating because some were like, you're just lying to us. Like, we don't believe you. That would have taken hundreds of millions of dollars and millions of man hours to get all that uranium and do all the science. Like, you're just messing with us. And others were like... Oh my God! By publishing that Nature paper in 1939, yeah, I like all these people. I just killed 100,000 Japanese wow. people. Like it's imagine what goes through your mind then. I mean, it's what Oppenheimer said. Watching Fucking it go cool. off. Fucking cool! This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Oppenheimer quote. Like now I am become death, destroyer of worlds. Yeah, the bottom of a Gita thing. It would have been funny though if like somebody tapped him on the shoulder and was like, "We don't really do religion in the workplace, Oppenheimer. <laughs> if you could just kind of keep your weird Hindu shit away from us." Religion provides good quotes to science. (laughs) Yeah, well, also, I mean, it would have been cooler if he threw in, like, a Marvel reference. Like, what if he was doing Thanos instead (laughs) instead of death? This wasn't personal. It was never personal. (laughs) This planet needs balancing. Rejoice! It was funny. I was looking into some of the other things, like, in modern times, some of the proposals we have for uses for nuclear weapons. So here is what has been proposed, and here's what's actually been used. These are some interesting things. One is the creation of artificial bays, which would work. Like, you just go over near the water, like, all right, we'll just put this here in the ground and then blow a huge fucking crater and you have a bay. We kind of did that at Bikini Atoll, probably. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. One is a... Nuke the whales. Well, nuke the nukes. So one of them is the idea of doing it for nuclear waste disposal. So you get a Fukushima-type incident, right? And now all of a sudden you have a meltdown and you're going to have the release of all this hot nuclear waste into the atmosphere, 
they have these tunnels that go under certain nuclear reactors that they can literally go to place a nuclear weapon underneath. And then if you start getting a meltdown scenario and it looks like you're going to lose containment on the thing, as the nuclear material, you, you literally dig a hole, you release the nuclear material down, detonate it, and hope that you obliterate all the bad parts of it as it goes off. That's actually an interesting idea because, yeah, if the uh, nuclear meltdown is like an unsustained chain reaction yes, that breaks too free. Hot. And if you hit that with a nuke, it's going to move all the yes, particles away. So yes. they're not going to have that chain And reaction. maybe do a neutron cascade in there to get rid of some of the stuff that's, that's, yeah. that's in there melting down <laughs> as well. Yeah, so that's an interesting one. What about nuke the sun? Just, just, shoot, <laughs> just, all, just, just shoot all your just weapons for vengeance, at the sun. Or? <laughs> the sun's nuking us. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And it's about time we fought back. <laughs> <laughs> We've been taking the sun's nukes like bitches. <laughs> My son died of skin cancer. <laughs> and sun fighting. <laughs> died in the sun war, the Apollo wars. <laughs> the sun wars of 2050. We and sent wave after wave after the sun of frontline infantry. <laughs> None of our boys made it back. <laughs> Oh, dear. Uh, it's been suggested for use in mining, like literally blowing open mines, and has been used in the early forms of fracking. No joke. In 1973, we used three nuclear weapons in the kind of early forms of the idea of fracking, which is basically sending a, a – in this case, we send an explosive device – deep down into lime and shale reserves where there's gas hiding in there, natural gas, and blew it up, causing enough of a disturbance that it forced a lot of those gas pockets out so we could then get the gas. Was this the government doing this, or was this like BP? Was, was British it, Petroleum yeah, had was, access to a nuclear was, arsenal? Was the Monopoly dude. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's a really thin veil between you know business interests and the military it literally <laughs> sounds like something Sco scrooge mcduck would propose and get shot down at his own company and how did the gas not ignite <laughs> wait till you hear about nukes for propulsion oh uh, yes there so are, yeah there are so this is a uh, this is uh, another concept we have which is using nukes as literally a way to propel a spaceship so imagine you are in a spaceship you shoot a nuclear device out behind you you detonate it and then that explosion wave literally carries you fa forward faster. Yeah, you have a good enough parabolic mirror, and that's releasing a ton of energy that's really concentrated. So it's a very cost-effective fuel, yes. you know, mass to energy release. And yes. they did calculations like we could get much farther than with our current designs, but they kind of didn't go with it because, you know, you have to drop a bunch of nukes behind you and it was so, a Doc, scary. Here's my problem with this, this concept. And it's my same problem that I have uh, with like fights in space. And Dr. Troy, you tell me if I'm, I'm reading this right or wrong. Like MMA fights in space? Yeah, yeah. like with a Dean Lister for a Sakuraba <laughs> in space. <laughs> Good luck with those soccer kicks to the head there, son. No. So one of the ideas is watch... Star Wars or something and you have two X-Wings fighting it out or an X-Wing fighting somebody out and they're shooting at each other and one guy blows up the other one. Now obviously you're going to talk about the fireballs in space, blah, 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 totally valid. Here's my other point. If you blow up a space fighter anywhere near you in space, you are dead because you've blown that thing up. That is now a grenade that we have talked about before, except we're used to grenades where you throw a grenade and it only has a radius of 25 feet because of gravity and air resistance and everything that slows down those pellets. A grenade in space, those things keep going at their initial speed, meaning if you get hit by it a light year away, assuming it hasn't hit some dust and slowed down or anything, it's the exact same as if you got hit by it right next, you were right next to it when it blew up. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Uh, a spaceship exploding would be like a shrapnel gr grenade. Um, fortunately, space distances are huge and the attenuation of the debris cloud would make it so that Within a reasonable distance, you're unlikely to get hit if it were to explode. Um, cause you would have to be so far away, though, because you it would Space take, is super far. Like, yeah, space battles would be definitely long distance. The smallest fraction BBs coming through your spaceship would destroy it, right? So, so it depends on both how it fragmented and the construction of your ship. And if sure. you can handle micrometeoroids, which I think most spaceships probably would if you're flying through So my space. argument is when that nuclear bomb explodes, you're not just having the force that's coming with the bomb. You're having shrapnel that's coming at a fast ahead of that force wave that's going to go right through your ship. I mean, a, a nuclear bomb would probably just disintegrate all the atoms in a spaceship. If you nuked a spaceship, I would imagine spaceship fighting would probably, they just use high-powered No, lasers. no, now I'm going back to the, the motor, the idea of putting this behind you and detonating oh, it. Oh, okay. The, uh, the shell of this bomb is going to come ripping through your ship. So yeah, that's why there was very careful design about parabolic reflector mirrors, which I don't know what they would be made of, but 
how sort of how beryllium is a neutron mirror. Okay. And there would also have to be crazy shock absorbers so that obviously you're not if there were humans or cargo inside the yeah. the main module, it can't withstand the impulse from a nuke. Yeah, I mean that's forces. that's a whole different thing, but I don't think you'd get that far. I think your shrapnel would wreck your ship. And it's the same as if if you blow up a ship anywhere in space that you can see Unless you happen to be part of the debris in which it's scattered beyond you, which would be pretty lucky, if you can see it, you're probably dead. My understanding of this, I, I didn't research this beforehand, was that they did like quite serious calculations and realized this could be feasible. I mean, there would be engineering problems, but the shockwave wasn't insurmountable. There were certain reflective materials and shock absorber type schemas. I mean, they didn't work out all the plans and the energy transfers would allow for travel to like really distant places and i'm not sure why exactly they didn't pursue it but it's crazy that it was kind of feasible and they also another thing i forget what it's called but there were plans for a nuclear scramjet during the cold war really that yes that would the this was the u.s it was like operation operation pluto or haiti something like that this there's definitely a wikipedia page but it would be a nuclear powered scramjet because it was nuclear powered it could fly for months at a time it would be spewing out tons of radiation. It could be carrying a bunch of nukes. The thought was, let's go send this thing over Russia. It will fly for months at a time at ground level at supersonic speeds, sending out a shockwave from the supersonic travel, spewing radiation and dropping nukes. And they just called a halt to it because they were like, this shit is too yeah, scary. That, yeah, that's like, got we, science fiction on us. The yeah. one... <laughs> Horseman of the Apocalypse. That's <laughs> yeah. that ship right there. I, yeah. And, and now when you go at that speed, that that ground level, the, there's just nothing that can shoot that shit out of the... Exactly. Like, how, how would you deal with that? You're not going to see it coming from a distance. It's going supersonically. Like, they, and they that's kind of why they didn't do it. Nets. They were like, this is Sweet too... nets. <laughs> Nucle and nuclear arms race is one thing. We can't have a nuclear scramjet race. Like, but, but the planet the, will die. This pilot would certainly die. I mean, he's... Everybody's dying. Well, it, it, it could be automated. I don't know. You okay. know, just a computer flying in a loop or something or zigzags. All right, let's move right on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is science articles. All right, guys, we're only doing one article this week because uh, we wanted to jump right into it. And we've already, by the way, gone super far on nuclear weapons. So we've already gone pretty, pretty, uh, pretty long, but we are going to talk about abiogenesis. Now, Troy, this was a suggestion you made about an article that just came out that talked about this idea of hybrids or chimeras between RNA and DNA as being a base. But first, let's take a reset and talk about what ab abiogenesis is and some of the ideas on it. So abiogenesis is life from non-life. It's the idea of how a living thing could come to be from a non-living thing. It's important to note that abiogenesis is separate and removed from evolution. So evolution can only take place once you have self-replicating life. Before then, the idea is abiogenesis. So one is chemical, one is biological, and they're, they're slightly different in that fashion. So what is abiogenesis? What is life and when did it happen? As far as we know, we talked about this a few weeks ago, we have definitive evidence of life at 3.5 billion years ago, but suggestive evidence of life at 3.9 billion years ago, which is pretty much as stuff is cooling off, seemingly making it seem like life is somewhat inevitable. So let's start with a question that sounds easy, but it's actually rather hard. How do you guys define life? I would say life is software in the form of genome plus hardware in the form of the rest of the biomolecules in the cell. And here I'm considering, you know, the first life to evolve. The active energy source would be metabolism. Mm -hmm. And the process of that little computer running would be life. And so you need the constant flux of metabolism or else there is no life. Okay. You need the genomic software and you need the cell that is able to self-replicate and propagate itself. Okay, so you brought up a good point there. Self-replication has obviously got to be one. All right, Damien? Life is anything that can find a way. <laughs> That's very, very gold blooming of you. Gold, gold blooming? Gold, gold bloomium, which is gold an, another, yes, uh, yes. another element that could be made into a nuclear <laughs> dirty bomb. Super dirty. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting, when it's, the reason it gets kind of hard to define life is you're like, all right, well, it has to extract energy, I guess, from the world around it. Well, things that aren't life do that. It has to be self-replicating. Crystals are self-replicating. It's weird when you get to these things and you start trying to hammer it down, you kind of find these edge cases where you're like, well, either this thing isn't alive or this thing is alive. And either way, we're going to have to rewrite some history books. Yeah, I think the reason people have difficulty contemplating this, and I've had to think deeply about it to be like, how do I yeah. explain life in a physics way? And it's 
It's software plus hardware plus metabolism, which is the fuel and runs the process of, you know, this little computer slash self-replicator running. But you did yours in like a very biological sense. That doesn't necessarily leave open the idea that you could have something artificial doing it. And I think you could without necessarily a genome. You could do the entire thing just based on a different structure. Wait, so I, I've lost my train of thought partway through the last okay. one, but this is, this is what I was going towards. So life is a little meat computer, but the difficulty humans have is that it is a far from thermodynamic equilibrium meat computer. So you are totally right. Crystal formation, snowflake formation, yeah. geological formation. That's like self-organization that looks designed. And self-replication. Yeah, yeah. And that is entropically driven. It's just matter yes. uh, maximizing entropy and minimizing free energy, but it is in thermodynamic equilibrium. Whereas life is a series of chemical reactions that is far from thermodynamic equilibrium. And once you get the first life going through abiogenesis, now you have this dynamic system that gets further and further away from thermodynamic equilibrium over the billions of years of evolution on, of life on Earth. And that's how you get increasing complexity. Yeah. And we didn't, obviously, we still don't know exactly how this happened or how life can come from non-life, but we do have a few good ideas. So you have to think of kind of the history of this concept about abiogenesis. In a way, it actually didn't start off as a mystery because it used to be self-evident to people, to quote-unquote natural philosophers or scientists, that life could just come from nowhere. So the idea was like barnacles. They thought barnacles just literally materialized out of the water. They would think that things like mold or bacterial growth or something was, was spontaneously growing out of the air without an, an existing life or structure behind it. It isn't until you get the idea of sterilization and pasteurization where we start realizing, oh, no, actually, usually life does not just spring up out of nowhere. And that becomes a fundamental constant of biology. So before the idea of sterilization or pasteurization, it was basically not unusual to just think of abiogenesis as a general way of life. Once we kind of got into that and it became a major steadfast of the idea of biology that that couldn't happen, now we had to figure out a method by which living things could come from non-living things. And this has a huge experimental history. You know, we have talked on this show before about one of the longest running experiments in science history, the Miller-Urey experiment from 1952, still going at UCSD a few miles away from here. And that was an idea to see what you could kind of come up with if you mixed methane, ammonia, and hydrogen in what we thought was the conditions of the primordial earth and put some electric shocks. And they were able to show that you could produce amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins and kind of what you would have floating around in a primordial stew if you had one. With Miller-Urey, do they – new technologies are invented all the time. So are they constantly updating the – so I, you're exactly right. I attended a conference a few months ago on molecular mechanisms of evolution, and it was really fascinating. It was also a lot of unpublished data. So it's just, it's mind blowing the kinds of work people are doing nowadays. And I got to see a talk about the, it's thought that the UV hitting the earth before our atmosphere changed from oxygenation and yeah. other things, the wavelengths that got through were very different. And this guy did modeling, you know, his whole lab shallow pools with these uv wavelengths will force certain chemical fluxes to prioritize the formation of some of the sugar or mm. protein molecules and others were like oh there are these driving forces in the form of uv and chemical environments and random mixes of things that can just push a mix of chemicals towards some stable arrangement of molecules that is dna or rna or peptides that then can come together and lipids that once you get um, individual genes, which the, the actual article we'll talk about gets into, those can be, we know there are viroids, which are sort of free floating little genes that can infect um, other species. And so maybe individual viroids formed uh, and then those coded for proteins that were driven by driving forces like UV and it's all far from thermodynamic equilibrium. And the answer to what is the reason for life that I like most is life uh, exists to hydrogenate carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is I've a seen very... your shirt. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm wearing it right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I remember that Katy Perry song. <laughs> <laughs> if you turn carbon dioxide into methane, that's a big increase in entropy. And so there is a strong driving force, just the way our universe works towards that. But there's no single reaction to do that. But you so instead you're like trying to roll a ball up a hill, yeah, and you just don't have enough energy to get it up the hill. And we're just the cart that gets the ball up the hill. And yeah, so quantum tunneling is basically you roll a ball up a hill without enough energy to get through, and with low probability, it just teleports through to the other side. And life is 
you try to roll CO2 to CH4 and you don't have enough force. Uh, and then you get these randomly formed chemical reaction chains that take you around the hill and to the other side without having to go through it. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're energy sinks. That's what we are. We, yeah. we are solar energy sinks that find way to, ways to take the sun's energy and the accumulated sun's energy and the planet uh, fossil fuels or, or other sun's energies from nuclear fuels that are lying around the earth and utilize them to do sweet things like send dick pics. Like that's our, <laughs> that is our modus operandi. Every second you're alive, you're speeding up the heat death of the universe. Yes, and the true. more you do things, the faster that heat death mm-hmm. comes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, eat so that, you productive assholes. <laughs> we still have billions of years. Don't worry. <laughs> so we're all being selfish. I mean, but without life in the universe, who would appreciate it? Exactly. So. You might think like, well, why is it so hard to create these things? So we talked about miller urey and they were able to create, you know, amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, but not necessarily able to create anything. And it, it took a while. And a lot of these experiments are kind of hard to replicate or kind of hard to do. And, we can say, why would there be a situation where life used to come out of non-living things and it doesn't now? And that's a really good question. And it's got a very simple answer, oxygen. So we didn't used to, in our atmosphere, have free-floating oxygen. We used to basically have methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. But when you get creatures that then create oxygen, whether those are photosynthetic or they're doing something else, when oxygen is the byproduct of some chemical element, as Dr. Troy mentioned earlier, oxygen is a very, very greedy little atom. Oxygen comes up to you and it grabs on and it holds tight. That's why we get things like rust. That's why we get fire. I mean, fire is literally the oxygenization of, of, of matter going through with the catalyst of heat. So oxygen is very greedy and grabs onto things. The problem with having any kind of life evolve from non-life now is that as those chemical processes are going through, you have oxygen in the air that all of a sudden, boom, gets in there, binds in there, and fucks everything up. That, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, oxygen totally prevents more abiogenesis. Mm-hmm. I would say also probably just its presence in the atmosphere changes the UV driving factors, at least based on the talk I saw. Sure. So it could make it less likely to happen. And just lack of competition. So now that there's yes. so much competition, like you take a microliter of pool uh-huh. water and it's going to have a ton of microbes. So there's just no chance for yes. life to arise. So on something its own. simple arises. The components of that is going to get eaten up by something much more advanced that has billions of years of evolutionary history. Yeah, it's it's totally new kid on the block syndrome. You can get there early, if, even if you're bad. But by the time somebody new gets there, the block is a hard place to be. That's why we need scientists like Troy to engineer these monsters that will carve a niche uh, forcefully now, in our ecosystem. We do know that somewhere around 3.5 billion years ago or something is Luca, the last universal common ancestor, meaning we share some kind of last common ancestor, not just with other humans, not just with apes, like you might have heard, or chimps or monkeys or primates or mammals. We actually share our genetic legacy with every living thing that we've ever found. That means plants, that means funguses, that means bacteria. Everything that's ever been alive you share a great 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 grandparent with so my active research i love physics but my active research is in microbial evolution i work mm-hmm. with e coli um, it's a model organism and i have a study that's going to be published soon where i took dna from a bunch of different species including humans i didn't ch- recode the dna put the exact human uh, sequence i removed the exons but put it into the e coli chromosome replaced its native gene entirely this is a four and a half million base pair piece of genomic software. I do that. It can't use the gene at all. It's exhibiting a sick phenotype like, oh, this gene has been removed. It gets a single base pair mutation change in its four and a half million base pairs of DNA that just upregulates that protein, gets it working. And that just blows my mind because we've been diverging from them for billions of years. Yeah. And there's, I mean- we really all come from Luca. We do, and we still can look back and share that. You know, I, th- I forgot what it is. It's like 50% of your genome or something is shared with a banana. We are related to all those other things. Now, there might be something out there that is of a different lineage, a different, a separate abiogenesis, right? It could have started and gone, and we just haven't found it, haven't sequenced it, haven't discovered it yet. But for now, for everything we see, all the kingdoms, every type of animal, plant, fungus, everything, it all can get traced back to some universal last common ancestor. So does that mean that abiogenesis only happened once. No, it doesn't for the same reason that Dr. Troy just talked about. It could be that abiogenesis was really common. Maybe 4 billion years ago, life was popping up everywhere. But one group got better than all the others. And that one dominated all the others. And that one is the only one that has living descendants that we know of. They could have even swapped their genes. Like maybe one's getting UV at the surface of the ocean and Mm -hmm. one's getting 
this carbon dioxide and hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean mm -hmm. got separate genes. And if they both use DNA and RNA, then yes. they could have little viroids. Some horizontal that gene transfer. Exactly. Yeah. But as far as we know, we all do share a lineage. So it could be that that one thing sprang to life once and life is really rare and it happened one time and it just happened to be successful and take over the entire world. Yeah, I mean, I think the assumption at this point is this stuff happens quickly because it happened really rapidly yes. after the Earth cooled. And you raise an interesting point, like all life that we know of is Luca based. But mm -hmm. what if there are some sort of subcontinental weird yes. like Bacteria subsurface of lakes that 50 yeah, meters under the ground? Yeah, yeah, that got driven by volcanic uh, flows like that's a possibility, mm -hmm. I guess that would be interesting. It, obviously, we wouldn't find something where we're like, oh, this armadillo isn't related to the rest. It would have to be something so divergent that when we first found it, we're like, what the fuck is this? And life, these self-replicating chemical systems could happen on any planet in the universe. Yeah. And even we have plans with NASA to send a submarine to Europa because Europa is a icy moon of, I think, Jupiter, where it's entirely enclosed by ice, but it has this subsurface ocean of water. And we know it has hydrothermal activity underneath the earth. So it could yeah. provide energy that it, way. There's an energy flux from geysers it emits. It has hydrocarbons or molecules that are kind of promising for potentially life. And so we're going to send a submarine there and see if... Something's going on, and that's amazing, like in our solar system, maybe. I hope they do James Cameron to do that. So this particular article was actually looking at an, an old question in this, which is, as we're talking about how this started, there's the question of RNA versus DNA. So there's a concept I've been familiar with for at least a decade called the RNA world hypothesis or theory, where it's basically that RNA was first. It's a little bit more simple. It can do the transcription and the coding and blah, 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 blah. So you had a world that was just RNA. Then you have something happen and DNA evolves and that's how you get a creature. Now, I still have a few questions about that. Like, for instance, right now, RNA is really only used by viruses as they're encoding, right? Like no animal or plant or anything uses RNA as its background other than transcription, right? Yeah, that's my understanding. I believe recently they've made a hybrid RNA DNA E. coli where it has a chromosome with part sure. RNA. But yeah, in nature, I don't think so. So viruses, for those of you guys who don't know, aren't usually considered alive. They don't have their own metabolism. They don't have their own. They're just basically a self-replicating little chain of information. So how would an RNA world work if the thing that's doing it can't live on its own? Like, see, like right now, at least it only has parasitic properties. So viruses aren't thought to have come around until quite a bit after the first life, just because sure. they're not life on their own. So yeah. they need they need a they need to steal metabolism. Yes. They they are literally a virus. They maliciously inject their software into a hardware uh, and steal time from the CPU yep. to get their proteins made. Yeah, the thought for the RNA world was like, oh, it's just a floppy molecule that can catalyze reactions and hold information. So it prob life probably started with that, and then DNA came next for more stable information. Is holding. a floppy molecule an insult to another molecule? Like, if I walked yeah. up to a DNA and like, look at you, you floppy molecule, you flaccid bitch. <laughs> yeah, you ever, you ever just sitting there trying to watch some free pirated porn, and all of a sudden the ad comes up about your, your floppy molecule? <laughs> now it's not holding everything together. I think rigid molecule would actually be more of an insult because then the enzymes need to flop around to carry out functions. So you, you, in the enzyme world, that's a that's a, it. Really is about the motion in the ocean in the yep. enzyme world. You don't want to be an erect molecule. No, you, you don't. Be a no, flaccid, rubbery. No, yep. I, yeah, that's a, in fact it's the opposite. That's why like in the RNA world, the, the female RNA gets together and they're like talking and they're like, oh man, did you hear how throbbing that Bill is? He's oh, horrible in gross. bed. Gross. Yeah. Ew. Yeah. <laughs> Their version of Magic Mike. My super dry protein redox Good center. Job. Yeah, there you go. Their version of Magic Mike uh, is just, uh, it looks like one of those, the, the, blow, wacko weight. the blow up guys outside of a car dealership. <laughs> <laughs> Molecules are fanning themselves. But so, the, Troy, in this particular article, they talked about the idea that instead of being a DNA based world or an RNA based world, maybe it was like a chimera a hybrid of the two because you can create a molecule by kind of mixing those two together that can then kind of become both of those in its separate parts. Yeah, so this is. This is a breakthrough in systems chemistry, which okay. is a recent field, which is just the understanding that the prebiotic world was a soup of all these different chemicals and UV driving things and hydrothermal vents driving things and far from equilibrium, uh, thermodynamic equilibrium processes. And so keep that in mind. Like it's not just going to be a pure world of RNA transitioning to DNA. And then the modeling they're doing is showing actually this helps explain how these systems can evolve. And my active research, I mean, biology is such a complex thing. You need a systems level approach to understand how a sure. living cell can come. And so I do systems biology, which is understanding sort of microbes by they have this metabolic network and it's really complicated, but it's ultimately the flux in and out of the cell of molecules and they are 
fueling metabolism and you can do sort of calculations based on constraints of how these molecules flow through the networks and systems chemistry is like constraints of you have these complicated soups of very various different things how do these systems evolve with time mm. yeah it is it's an interesting idea of like how uh, we thought it was RNA. We thought it was DNA. Hey, it's probably just both. Like, how how often does it work where they're like, let's compromise? That's science. That's politics. That's not science. Politics is about compromise. And lastly, the thing I just want to end this conversation on is to think about if life started so quickly on Earth, and this is the thing I've always had an interesting kind of hang up on. Life seems to have started very quickly on Earth. If that's the case, the Fermi paradox makes so much less sense. Because if life was so quick to start here and almost seemingly inevitable and jumping out of nowhere, why is it that it doesn't seem to be around to other places? And there's, you know, the arguments, well, there's probably plenty of life and it's just not intelligent or the intelligent life kills itself off or we can't see the radio signals or we are, I mean, probably the best one I've heard is just like, you're looking for radio signals and stuff. Uh, imagine if there was a group in the 1700s that were looking into space and wondering why nobody was sending them messages. And you would say like, well, you don't get radio signals. And they'd have no idea what it is. There's probably some technology that's that level ahead of us and we're not getting it. But regardless, that, that still doesn't quite make sense to me because it seems like you'd have to go through a phase where you'd have radio signals and then we'd still be getting that phase of, of existence. Regardless, the life thing seems to be kind of the hang up for me with the contradiction of the Fermi paradox. I think I can address the Fermi paradox reasonably well. Um, one, we know we live quite early on in the history of the universe, yes. actually. Like if, if we think the universe is going to go for infinity years and the first red dwarfs haven't even burned out yet, like there hasn't been a lot of time. And we can look at the evolutionary history of life on Earth and realize, okay, life happened right away. But how long did it take to get intelligent life? Well, sure. Luca was like, or, you know, the first life was maybe 4 billion years yeah. ago, like right after the planet. That takes another couple billion years yes. to even reach eukaryote level. So you're going with one that's been proposed before, too, which is we're first. Or we're so early on that we might as well be first. No, not necessarily. We're just, we're maybe the potentially the first intelligent. So this is more the filter argument sure. because, okay, from life to a eukaryote, which is still a unicellular life, but it's more complicated, takes 2 billion more years, sure. even though life happens right away. Then from the eukaryote to multicellular or to animals takes another billion or so years, I think, something like that. And then, you know, animals to true intelligence, humans, I mean, that was only a couple hundred thousand years ago. So true. it's- any time that's a long but you're span still of, making well, the assumption that we're first so no so okay there's a long span of time and planets are subject to random events that could easily wipe out life at any time so it, there's a good chance that maybe life is popping up all over and it's microbial uh and it's in subsurface oceans of icy moons that's probably never going to get technologically advanced because it's not going to get limbs and fire and technology but also even on planets with atmospheres that could be popping up, but just if you have to maintain stability for 4 billion years to even get a chance of finally evolving enough complexity to get intelligent life, you, you could have a solar flare that's huge enough. You could have a gamma ray burst. There are sure. so many things that could happen. But again, we're a lab that shows that it's possible, right? So unless we're saying it's so unlikely that we are the N of one, and if we are, we have to figure out what is making us the unlikely ones. That's, that's why I'm so excited for the James Webb Space Telescope, mm -hmm. because my hypothesis is... Life is going to be really common, and it's just intelligent life that's rare. I think that's probably uh, true. And so when we can survey exoplanet atmospheres in and our see galaxy. the methane or whatever coming out Exactly. Of and yes. that in the you know billions of years from the first life to even mildly more sophisticated microbial life, that's going to change the atmosphere of the planet. And so maybe in the next hundred million years, it's going to die from some big event and never reach uh, technological complexity. But soon we'll be able to say. See, I think it might actually be that we are in a very, very unique place. And it might be because we've talked about this before, about how the Earth essentially wouldn't have liquid water if it wasn't for the collision with Theia that it had early on, where it essentially was unlike the other rocky planets in which all the liquid water was lost long ago. We had liquid water from an, a planet that was further out come into our orbit, strike us, deposit a bunch of that water. Also, atmospheric conditions in the moon and Jupiter, all these things that happen to be in place so that we could have a liquid water and an atmosphere and we're not bombarded by extraterrestrial impacts all the time and we're actually relatively safe and we have a stable orbit and atmosphere and relatively good seasons, all that kind of stuff. Maybe that is just really unique. I, I agree with you that there is not going to be DNA-based life elsewhere in the universe, mm -hmm. but there are thoughts on all these are self-replicating chemical systems driven by entropy yeah. and you could have 
ammonia potentially as your liquid instead of water for the cells. And there are thoughts on alternative chemistries and differences in the UV and the atmosphere will affect the driving forces that make these molecules self-assemble. So I would expect my guess is there's lots of life. It's going to be DNA-like. We know you can have different types of base pairs. We've made them in the lab. It's going to be a self-replicating chemical system that's been subject to evolution of whatever its code is. It's not going to be DNA. Um, And it's going to change the atmosphere of its planet with its metabolism. Yeah. You bring up a good point with the fact that not all life will be based, you know, could be based on ammonia or not water. That's really blown a hole in my Star Trek fan fiction where I get to fuck a lot of aliens. Truth be told... A lot of them probably aren't going to be fuckable. You are absolutely correct. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's, uh, life is going to be very common. I'm sorry. Did life you... is going to be less common. And fuckable life is going to be. Did you forget that the universe was seeded with the same genetic material that allowed all these hominid, uh, hominoid species to all get together in the Star Trek universe? It's like you're not even a nerd. Is that Star Trek lore? Yeah, is that yeah. why they all look? Yeah, well, that, that, was, it, that, yeah, that kind of makes the, sense. It was that that was generation the generation episode where yeah. they all had to work. To the, the, the grand plan of the designers, they had to work together, and that's why I want to fuck Cleons. I love Hedridges. <laughs> I still don't know when they're actually inserting that DNA because, like, otherwise that means that they seeded the planet with humanoid DNA and they got everything from bananas and mice to humans, and then the other one they seeded and they got like Klingons and warthog. Like, it's just that, that's kind of weird. But other than that. You know, and they never really get into, like, there's clearly facial differences. There has to be genitalia differences. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Somebody's got a spike. (laughs) All right. Thank you, audience, for coming back for Science Faction 367, where you learned all about the origins of nuclear weapons again and about abiogenesis. Thank you so much for joining us, and come on back this Thursday for Science Faction 368. General, sir. All of our astronaut applicants have left the building after we informed them that none of the aliens they would meet on this mission would be fuckable. You've been listening to Science Fuction. Wait, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs>